Chapter 9 of The Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 9 Submarine Boats. The introduction of torpedoes for use against an enemy's ships below the waterline has led by natural stages to the evolution of a vessel which may approach unsuspected, close enough to the object of attack to discharge its missile effectively. Before the searchlight was adopted, a night surprise gave due concealment to small craft, but now that the gloom of midnight can be in an instant flooded with the brilliance of day, a more subtle mode of attack becomes necessary. Hence the genesis of the submarine or submersible boat, so constructed as to disappear beneath the sea at a safe distance from the doomed ship, when its torpedoes has been sped to retrace its invisible course until outside the radius of destruction. To this end, many so-called submarine boats have been invented and experimented with during recent years. The idea is an ancient one, revived indeed as are the large proportion of our boasted modern discoveries. Aristotle describes a vessel of this kind, a diving bell rather than a boat, however, used in the siege of Tyre more than 2,000 years ago, and also refers to the divers being provided with an air tube, like the trunk of an elephant, by means of which they drew a fresh supply of air from above the surface, a contrivance adopted in more than one of our modern submarines. Alexander the Great is said to have employed divers in warfare. Pliny speaks of an ingenious diving apparatus, and Bacon refers to air tubes used by divers. We even find traces of weapons of offense being employed. Calivius is credited with the invention of a submarine gun for projecting Greek fire. The Bishop of Uppsala in the 16th century gives a somewhat elaborate description of certain leather skiffs or boats used to scuttle ships by attacking them from beneath, two of which he claims to have personally examined. In 1629, we read that the Barbary Corsairs fixed submarine torpedoes to the enemy's keel by means of divers. As early as 1579, an English gunner named William Bourne, patented a submarine boat of his own invention fitted with leather joints, so contrived as to be made smaller or larger by the action of screws, ballasted with water, and having an air pipe as mast. The Campbell Ash submarine, tried in 1885, was on much the same principle. Cornelius von Drebbel, an ingenious Dutchman who settled in England before 1600, produced certain submersible vessels and obtained for them the patronage of two kings. He claimed to have discovered a means of reoxygenating the foul air and so enabling his craft to remain a long time below water. Whether this was done by chemical treatment, compressed air, or by surface tubes, no record remains. Drebbel's success was such that he was allowed to experiment on the Thames and James I, accompanied on one of his sub-aquatic journeys. In 1626, Charles I gave him an order to make boats to go under water, as well as water mines, water petards, etc., presumably for the campaign against France, but we do not hear of these weapons of destruction being actually used upon this occasion. These early craft seem to have been generally moved by oars working in air-tight leather sockets. But one constructed at Rotterdam in about 1654 was furnished with a paddle wheel. Coming now nearer to our own times, we find that an American called Bushnell had a like inspiration in 1773, when he invented his famous turtles, small upright boats in which one man could sit submerge himself by means of leather bottles with the mouths projecting outside, propel himself with a small set of oars, and steer with an elementary rudder. 
an unsuccessful attempt was made to blow up the English fleet with one of these turtles carrying a torpedo, but the current proved too strong and the missile exploded at a harmless distance, the operator being finally rescued from an unpremeditated sea trip. Bushnell was the author of the removable safety keel now uniformly adopted. Soon afterwards, another New Englander took up the running. Fulton, one of the cleverest and least appreciated engineers of the early years of the 19th century, his Nautilus, built in the French dockyards, was in many respects the pattern for our own modern submarines. The cigar-shaped copper hull, supported by iron ribs, was 24 feet 4 inches long, with a greatest diameter of 7 feet. Propulsion came from a wheel, rotated by a hand winch in the center of the stern. Forward was a small conning tower, and the boat was steered by a rudder. There was a detachable keel below, and fitted into grooves on the top were a collapsible mast and sail for use on the surface of the water. An anchor was also carried externally. In spite of the imperfect materials at his disposal, Fulton had much success. At Brest he took a crew of three men twenty-five feet down, and on another day blew up an old hulk. In the Seine two men went down for twenty minutes and steered back to their starting point under water. He also put in air at high pressure and remained submerged for hours, but France, England, and his own country in turn rejected his invention, and, completely discouraged, he bent his energies to designing boat engines instead. In 1821, Captain Johnson, also an American, made a submersible vessel 100 feet long, designed to fetch Napoleon from St. Helena, traveling for the most part on the surface. The expedition never came off. Two later inventions by Castera and Payenne in 1827 and 1846, respectively, were intended for more peaceful objects. Being furnished with diving chambers, the occupants could retrieve things from the bottom of the sea, Castera providing his boat with an air tube to the surface. Bauer, another inventor, lived for some years in England under the patronage of Prince Albert, who supplied him with the funds for his experiments. With Brunel's help, he built a vessel, which was indiscreetly modified by the naval authorities and finally sank and drowned its crew. Going then to Russia, he constructed sundry submarines for the Navy, but was in the end thrown over and, like Fulton, had to turn himself to other employment. The fact is that up to this period, the cry for a practical submarine to use in warfare had not yet arisen, or these inventions would have met with a far different reception. Within the last half century, all has changed. America and France now rival each other in construction, while the other nations of Europe look on with intelligent interest and make their contributions towards solving the problem of underwave propulsion. America led the way during the Civil War blockades in 1864, when the Housatonic was sunk in Charleston Harbor and damage done to other ships but these experimental torpedo boats were clumsy contrivances compared with their modern successors, for they could only carry their destructive weapon at the end of a spar projecting from the bows, to be exploded upon contact with the obstacle and probably involve the aggressor in a common ruin. So nothing more was done till the perfecting of the Whitehead torpedo, see dirigible torpedoes, gave the required impetus to fresh enterprise. France, experimenting in the same direction, produced in 1889 Goubet's submarine, patent of a private investor who has also been patronized by other navies. These are very small boats, the first 16 and a half feet long, carrying a crew of two or three men. Goubet No. 2, built in 1899, is 26 and one quarter feet long, composed of several layers of gunmetal united by strong screw bolts, and so able to resist the very great pressure. They are egg or spindle shaped, supplied with compressed air, able to sink and rise by rearrangement of water ballast. Reservoirs in the hull 
are gradually filled for submersion with water, which is easily expelled when it is desired to rise again. If this system goes wrong, a false keel of 3,600 weight can be detached and the boat springs up to the surface. The propulsive force is electricity, which works the diving screw at the rear, and the automobile torpedo is discharged from its tube by compressed air. By the aid of an optical tube, which a pneumatic telescope apparatus enables the operator to thrust above the surface and pull down in a moment, the captain of the Goubet can, when near the surface, see what is going on around him. This telescope has a system of prisms and lenses which cause the image of the sea surface to be deflected down to the eye of the observer below. Fresh air for the crew is provided by reservoirs of oxygen, and accumulations of foul air can be expelled by means of a small pump. Enough fresh air can be compressed into the reservoirs to last the crew for a week or more. The gymnote laid down in 1898 is more than double the size of the Goubet. It is cigar-shaped, 29 feet long by 6 feet diameter, with a displacement of 30 tons. The motive power is also electricity stored in accumulators for use during submersion, and the speed expected, but not realized, was to be 10 knots. Five years later, this type was improved upon in the Gustave Zede, the largest submarine ever yet designed. This boat, built of phosphor bronze with a single screw, measures 131 feet in length and has a displacement of 266 tons. She can contain a crew of nine officers and men, carries three torpedoes, though with one torpedo tube instead of two, has a lightly armored conning tower, and is said to give a surface speed of 13 knots and to make eight knots when submerged. At a trial of her powers, made in the presence of Monsieur Lacroix, Minister of Marine, she affixed an unloaded torpedo to the battleship Magenta and got away unobserved. The whole performance of the boat on that occasion was declared to be most successful, but its cost proved excessive considering the small radius of action obtainable and a smaller vessel of the same type, the Morse, 118 by 9 feet, is now the official size for that particular class. In 1896, a competition was held and won by the submersible Narval of Monsieur Le Boeuf, a craft shaped much like the ordinary torpedo boat. On the surface or awash, the Narval works by means of a brule engine burning fuel oil to heat its boilers, but when submerged for attack with funnel shut down, is driven by electric accumulators. She displaces 100-odd tons and is provided with four Dizwiki torpedo tubes. Her radius of action, steaming awash, is calculated at some 250 miles, or 70 miles when proceeding underwater at five knots an hour. This is the parent of another class of boats designed for offensive tactics, while the Morse type is adapted chiefly for coast and harbor defense. The French Navy includes altogether 30 submarine craft, although several of these are only projected at present, and none have yet been put to practical tests of actual warfare, the torpedoes used in experimenting being, of course, blank. Meanwhile, in America, experiments have also been proceeding since 1887, when Mr. Holland of New York produced the vessel that bears his name. This, considerably modified, has now been adopted as model by our Navy Department, which is building some half dozen on very similar lines. Though it is not easy to get any definite particulars concerning French submarines, Americans are less reticent, and we have graphic accounts of the Holland and her offspring from those who have visited her. These vessels, though cigar-shaped like most others, in some respects resemble the narval, being intended for long runs on the surface when they burn oil in a four-cylinder gasoline engine of 160 horsepower. Underwater, they are propelled by electric 
waterproof motor of 70 horsepower and proceeded a pace of 7 knots. There is a superstructure for deck with a funnel for the engine and a small conning tower protected by 4-inch armor. The armament carried comprises five 18-inch whitehead torpedoes, 11 feet 8 inches long, 120 tons is the displacement, including tank capacity for 850 gallons of gasoline. The full length is 63 feet 4 inches, with a beam of 11 feet 9 inches. The original Holland boat is thus described by an adventurous correspondent who took a trip in her. The Holland is 53 feet long, and in its widest part, is ten and a quarter feet in diameter. It has a displacement of seventy-four tons and what is called a reserve buoyancy of two and one-half tons, which tends to make it come to the surface. The frames of the boat are exact circles of steel. They are set a little more than a foot apart. They diminish gradually in diameter from the center of the boat to the bow and stern. On the top of the boat, a flat superstructure is built to afford a walking platform, and under this are spaces for exhaust pipes and for the external outfit of the boat, such as ropes and a small anchor. The steel plates which cover the frame are from one-half to three-eighths of an inch in thickness. From what may be called the center of the boat, a turret extends upwards through the superstructure for about 18 inches. It is two feet in diameter and is the only means of entrance to the boat. It is the place from which the boat is operated. At the stern is an ordinary three-bladed propeller and an ordinary rudder, and in addition there are two horizontal rudders, diving rudders they are called, which look like the feet of a duck spread out behind as it swims along the water. From the bow, two-thirds of the way to the stern, there is flooring, beneath which are the storage batteries, the tank for the gasoline, and the tanks which are filled with water for submerging. In the last one-third of the boat, the flooring drops away, and the space is occupied by the propelling machinery. There are about a dozen openings in the boat, the chief being three Kingston valves, by means of which the submerging tanks are filled or emptied. Others admit water to pressure gauges, which regulate or show the depth of the vessel under water. There are twelve dead lights in the top and sides of the craft. To remain under water, the boat must be kept in motion, unless an anchor is used. It can be steered to the surface by the diving rudders, or sent flying to the top through emptying the storage tanks. If it strikes bottom or gets stuck in the mud, it can blow itself loose by means of compressed air. It cannot be sunk unless pierced above the flooring. It has a speed capacity of from 8 to 10 knots, either on the surface or under water. It can go 1,500 miles on the surface without renewing its supply of gasoline. It can go fully 40 knots under water without coming to the surface and there's enough compressed air in the tanks to supply a crew with fresh air for 30 hours, if the air is not used for any other purpose, such as emptying the submerging tanks, it can dive to a depth of 20 feet in 8 seconds. The interior is packed with machinery. As you climb down the turret, you are confronted at once. There is a diminutive compass, which must be avoided carefully by the feet, a pressure gauge is directly in front of the operator's eye as he stands in position. There are speaking tubes to various parts of the boat and a signal bell to the engine room. As the operator's hands hang by his sides, he touches a wheel on the port side by turning which he steers the little vessel and one on the starboard side by turning which he controls the diving machinery. After the top is clamped down, the operator can look out through plate glass windows, about one inch wide and three inches long, which encircle the turret. So long as the boat is running on the surface, these are valuable, giving a complete view of the surroundings if the water is smooth. 
After the boat goes beneath the surface, these windows are useless. It is impossible to see through the water. Steering must be done by compass, until recently considered an impossible task in a submarine boat. A tiny electric light in the turret shows the operator the direction in which he is going and reveals the markings of the depth gauges. If the boat should pass under an object such as a ship, a perceptible shadow would be noticed through the deadlights, but that is all. The ability to see fishes swimming about in the water is a pleasant fiction. The only clear space in the body of the boat is directly in front of the bench on which the man in the turret is standing. It is where the 18-inch torpedo tube and the 8 and 5 8 inch aerial gun are loaded. Along the sides of this open space are six compressed air tanks containing 30 cubic feet of air at a pressure of 2,000 pounds to a square inch. Nearby is a smaller tank containing 3 cubic feet of air at 50 pounds pressure. A still smaller tank contains 2 cubic feet of air at 10 pounds pressure. These smaller tanks supply the compressed air, which, with the smokeless powder, is used in discharging the projectiles from the boat. Directly behind the turret, up against the roof on the port side, is the little engine by which the vessel is steered. It is worked by compressed air. Fastened to the roof on the starboard side is the driving engine, with discs that look as large as dinner plates stood on end. These discs are diaphragms, on which the water pressure exerts an influence, counteracting certain springs which are set to keep the diving rudders at a given pitch, and thus ensuring an immersion of an exact depth during a run. At one side is a cubic steel box, the air compressor, and directly in the center of this part of the boat is a long pendulum, just as there is in the ordinary torpedo, which by swinging backwards and forwards as the boat dives and rises, checks a tendency to go down too far or to come up at too sharp an angle. On the floor are the levers which, when raised and moved in certain directions, fill or empty the submerging tanks. On every hand are valves and wheels and pipes, in such apparent confusion as to turn a layman's head. There are also pumps in the boat, a ventilating apparatus, and a sounding contrivance by means of which the channel is picked out when running under water. This sounding contrivance consists of a heavy weight attached to a piano wire passing from a reel out through a stuffing box in the bottom. There are also valves which release fresh air to the crew. Although in ordinary runs from one half to one hour this is not necessary, the fresh air received from the various exhausts in the boat being sufficient to apply all necessities in that length of time. Another submersible of somewhat different design is the production of the Swedish inventor Mr. Nordenfelt. The boat is nine and a half meters in length and has a displacement of 60 tons. Like the Goubet, it sinks only in a horizontal position, while the Holland plunges downward at a slight angle. On the surface, a steam engine of 100 horsepower propels it, and when the funnel is closed down and the vessel submerges itself, the screws are still driven by superheated steam from the large reservoir of water boiling at high pressure, which maintains a constant supply. Three circulation pumps keeping this in touch with the boiler. The plunge is accomplished by means of two protected screws, and when they cease to move, the reserve buoyancy of the boat brings it back to the surface. It is steered by a rudder, which a pendulum regulates. The most modern of these boats is of English manufacture, built at Barrow, and tried in Southampton water. The vessels hitherto described should be termed submersible rather than submarine, as they are designed to usually proceed on the surface, and submerge themselves only for action when in the sight of the enemy. American ingenuity has produced an absolutely unique craft to which the name submarine may with real appropriateness be applied, for sinking in water 100 feet deep, it can remain below and run 
upon three wheels along the bottom of the sea. This is the Argonaut, invented by Mr. Simon Lake of Baltimore, and its main portion consists of a steel framework of cylindrical form, which is surmounted by a flat, hollow steel deck. During submersion, the deck is filled with water and thus saved from being crushed by outside pressure. When moving on the surface, it has the appearance of an ordinary ship, with its two light masts, a small conning tower on which is the steering wheel, bowsprit, ventilators, a derrick, suction pump, and two anchors. A gasoline engine of special design is used for both surface and submerged cruising under ordinary circumstances, but in time of war, storage batteries are available. An electric dynamo supplies light to the whole interior, including a 4,000 candle power searchlight in the extreme bow, which illuminates the pathway while under water. On the boat being stopped and given the order to submerge, the crew first throw out sounding lines to make sure of the depth. Then they close down the external openings and retreat into the boat through the conning tower, within which the helmsman takes his stand, continuing to steer as easily as when outside. The valves which fill the deck and submersion tanks are opened, and the Argonaut drops gently to the floor of the ocean. The two apparent masts are in reality three-inch iron pipes, which rise thirty feet or more above the deck, and so long as no greater depth is attained, they supply the occupants with fresh air and let exhausted gases escape, but close automatically when the water reaches their top. Once upon the bottom of the sea, this versatile submarine begins its journey as a tricycle. It is furnished with a driving wheel on either side, each of which is six and one-half feet in diameter and weighs 5,000 pounds, and is guided by a third wheel weighing 2,000 pounds journaled in the rudder. On a hard bottom or against a strong tide, the wheels are most effective owing to their weight, but in passing through soft sand or mud, the screw propeller pushes the boat along, the driving wheels running loose. In this way she can travel through even waist-deep mud, the screw working more strongly than on the surface because it has such a weight of water to help it, and she moves more easily uphill. In construction, the Argonaut is shaped something like a huge cigar, her strong steel frames spaced 20 inches apart being clad with steel plates 3 eighths inch thick, double riveted over them. Great strength is necessary to resist the pressure of the superincumbent water, which at a depth of 100 feet amounts to 44 pounds per square inch. Originally, she was built 36 feet long, but was subsequently lengthened by some 20-odd feet and has 9 feet of beam. She weighs 57 tons when submerged. A false section of keel, 4,000 pounds in weight, can on emergency be instantly released from inside, and two downhaul weights, each of 1,000 pounds, are used as an extra precaution for safety when sinking in deep water. The interior is divided into various compartments, the living quarters consisting of the cabin, galley, operating chamber, and engine room. There is also a division containing stores and telephone, the intermediate and the diver's room. The operating room contains the levers, hand wheels, and other mechanism by which the boat movements are governed. A water gauge shows her exact depth below the surface. A dial on either side indicates any inclination from horizontal. Certain levers open valves which admit water to the ballast tanks in the hold. Another releases the false keel. There's a cyclometer to register the wheel traveling, and other gauges mark the pressure of steam, speed of engines, etc. A compass in the conning tower enables the navigator to steer a true course, whether above or below the surface. This conning tower, only six feet high, rises above the center of the living quarters and is of steel with small windows in the upper part. Encircling it to about three-quarters of its height is a reservoir for gasoline, 
which feeds into a smaller tank within the boat for consumption. The compressed air is stored in two Mannesmann steel reservoirs, which have been tested to a pressure of 4,000 pounds per square inch. This renews the air supply for the crew when the Argonaut is long below and also enables the diving operations to be carried on. The maximum speed at which the Argonaut travels submerged is five knots an hour, and when she has arrived at her destination, say a sunken coal steamer, the working party pass into the intermediate chamber, whose airtight doors are then closed. A current of compressed air is then turned on until the air is equal in pressure to that in the diver's room. The doors of this close over India rubber to be air and water tight. One communicates with the intermediate. The other is a trap which opens downward into the sea. Through three windows in the prow, those remaining in the room can watch operations outside within a radius varying according to the clearness of the water. The divers assume their suits to the helmets of which a telephone is attached, so arranged that they are able to talk to each other as well as to those in the boat. They are also provided with electric lamps and a brilliant flood of light streams upon them from the bows of the vessel. The derrick can be used with ease underwater and the powerful suction pump will retrieve coal from a submerged vessel into a barge above at the rate of 60 tons per hour. It will thus be seen how valuable a boat of this kind may be for salvage operations as well as for surveying the bottom of harbors, river mouths, sea coasts, and so on. In wartime it can lay or examine submarine mines for harbor defense, or, if employed offensively, can enter the enemy's harbor with no chance of detection and there destroy his mines or blow up his ships with perfect impunity. To return the Argonaut to the surface it is only necessary to force compressed air into the space below the deck and the four tanks in the hold. Her buoyancy being thus gradually restored, she rises slowly and steadily till she is again afloat upon the water and steams for land. We have now glanced briefly at some of the most interesting attempts out of many dozens to produce a practical submarine vessel in bygone days, and have inquired more closely into the construction of several modern designs. Among these, the Holland has received special attention, as that is the model adopted by our Admiralty, and our own new boats only differ in detail from their American prototype. But before quitting this subject, it will be well to consider what is required from the navigating engineer and how far present invention has supplied the demand. The perfect submarine of fiction was introduced by Jules Verne, whose Nautilus remains a masterpiece of scientific imagination. This marvelous vessel plowed the seas with equal power and safety, whether on the surface or deeply sunk beneath the waves bearing the pressure of many atmospheres. It would rest upon the ocean floor while its inmates, clad in diving suits, issued forth to stroll amid aquatic forests and scale marine mountains. It gathered fabulous treasures from pearl beds and sunken galleons, and could ram and sink an offending ship a thousand times its size without dinting or loosening a plate on its own hull. No weather deflected its compass, no movement disturbed its equilibrium. Its crew followed peacefully and cheerfully in their spacious cabins a daily round of duties which electric power and automatic gear reduced to a minimum, save for the misadventure of a shortened air supply when exploring the polar pack and the clash of human passions Captain Nemo's guests would have voyaged in a floating paradise. Compare this entrancing creation the most practical vessels of actual experiment. They are a small, blind craft, groping their way perilously when below the surface, the steel and electrical machinery sadly interfering with any trustworthy working of their compass, and the best form of periscope hitherto introduced 
forming a very imperfect substitute for ordinary vision. Their speed, never very fast upon the surface, is reduced by submersion to that of the oldest and slowest gunboats. Their radius of action is also circumscribed, that is, they cannot carry supplies sufficient to go a long distance, deal with a hostile fleet, and then return to headquarters without replenishment. Furthermore, there arise the nice questions of buoyancy combined with stability when afloat, of sinking quickly out of sight, and of keeping a correct balance under water. The equilibrium of such small vessels navigating between the surface and the bottom is extremely sensitive. Even the movements to and fro of the crew are enough to imperil them. To meet this difficulty, the big water ballast tanks, engines, and accumulators are necessarily arranged at the bottom of the hull, and a pendulum working a helm automatically is introduced to keep it longitudinally stable. To sink the boat, which is done by changing the angle of the propeller in the goubet and some others, and by means of horizontal rudders and vanes in the Nordenfeld and Holland, it must first be accurately balanced bow and stern exactly in trim. Then the boat must be put into precise equilibrium with the water, that is, must weigh just the amount of water displaced. For this, its specific gravity must be nearly the same as that of the water, whether salt or fresh, and a small accident might upset all calculations. Collision, even with a large fish, could destroy the steering gear and a dent in the side would also tend to plunge it at once to destruction. Did it escape these dangers and succeed in steering an accurate course to its goal? We have up to now little practical proof that the mere act of discharging its torpedo, though the weight of the missile is intended to be automatically replaced immediately as it drops from the tube, may not suffice to send the vessel either to the bottom or the top of the sea, in the latter case, it would be within danger zone of its alarmed enemy, and at his mercy, its slow speed, even if uninjured, leaving it little chance of successful flight. But whatever the final result, one thing is certain, that, untried as it is, the possible contingency of a submarine attack is likely to shake the morale of an aggressive fleet. When the first submarine torpedo boat goes into action, says Mr. Holland, she will bring us face to face with a most perplexing problem ever met in warfare. She will present the unique spectacle, when used in attack, of a weapon against which there is no defense. You can send nothing against the submarine boat, not even itself. You cannot see underwater, hence you cannot fight underwater. Hence, you cannot defend yourself against an attack underwater except by running away. This inventor is, however, an enthusiast about the future awaiting the submarine as a social factor. His boat has been tested by long voyages on and below water with complete success. The Argonaut also upon one occasion traveled a thousand miles with five persons and proved herself habitable, seaworthy, and under perfect control. Mr. Holland confidently anticipates in the near future a channel service of submerged boats run by automatic steering gear upon cables stretched from coast to coast and eloquently sums up its advantages. The passage would always be practicable for ordinary interruptions such as fog and storms cannot affect the sea depths. An even temperature would prevail summer and winter, the well-warmed and lighted boats also being free from smoke and spray. No nauseating smells would proceed from the evenly working electric engines. No motion cause seasickness, no collision be apprehended, as each line would run on its own cable and at its own specified depth, a telephone keeping it in communication with shore. In like manner, a service might be plied over lake bottoms or across the bed of wide rivers whose surface is bound in ice. Such is the submarine boat 
as hitherto conceived for peace or war, a daring project for the coming generation to justify. End of chapter 9. Submarine Boats. Recording by Tom Mack. Tucson, Arizona. Chapter 10 of the Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Lothridge. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 10 Animated Pictures. Has it ever occurred to the reader to ask himself why rain appears to fall in streaks, though it arrives at earth in drops, or why the glowing end of a charred stick produces fiery lines if waved about in the darkness? Common sense tells us the drop in the burning point cannot be in two places at one and the same time, and yet apparently we are able to see both in many positions simultaneously. This seeming paradox is due to persistence of vision, a phenomenon that has attracted the notice of scientific men for many centuries. Persistence may be briefly explained thus. The eye is extremely sensitive to light, and will, as is proved by the visibility of the electric spark, lasting for less than the millionth part of a second, receive impressions with marvelous rapidity. But it cannot get rid of these impressions at the same speed. The duration of a visual impression has been calculated as one-tenth to one twenty first of a second. The electric spark, therefore, appears to last much longer than it really does. Hence it is obvious that if a series of impressions follow one another more rapidly than the eye can free itself of them, the impressions will overlap, and one of four results will follow. a. Apparently uninterrupted presence of an image in the same image may be repeatedly represented b. Confusion if the images be all different and disconnected. c. Combination if the images of two or a very few objects be presented in regular rotation. d. Motion if the objects be similar in all but one part, which occupies a slightly different portion in each presentation. In connection with c, an interesting story is told of Sir J. Herschel by Charles Babbage. Quoted from Mr. Henry V. Hopwood's Living Pictures, to which book the author is indebted for much of his information in this chapter. One day Herschel, sitting with me after dinner, amusing himself by spinning a pair upon the table, suddenly asked whether I could show him the two sides of a shilling at the same moment. I took out of my pocket a shilling, and holding it up before the looking-glass, pointed out my method. No, said my friend, that won't do. Then, spinning my shilling upon the table, he pointed out his method of seeing both sides at once. The next day I mentioned the anecdote to the late Dr. Fitton, who a few days after brought me a beautiful illustration of the principle. It consisted of a round disk of card suspended between two pieces of sewing silk. These threads, being held between the finger and thumb of each hand, were then made to turn quickly, when the disk of card, of course, revolved also. Upon one side of this disc of card was painted a bird, upon the other side an empty bird cage. On turning the thread rapidly, the bird appeared to have got inside the cage. We soon made numerous applications, as a rat on one side and a trap on the other, etc. It was shown to Captain Cater, Dr. Williston, and many of our friends, and was, after the lapse of a short time, forgotten. Some months after, during dinner at the Royal Society Club, Sir Joseph Banks, being in the chair, I heard Mr. Barrow, then secretary to the Admiralty, talking very loudly about a wonderful invention of Dr. Paris, the object of which I could not quite understand. It was called the Thaumatrope, and was said to be sold at the Royal Institution in Albemarle Street. Suspecting that it had some connection with our unnamed toy, I went next morning and purchased for seven shillings and sixpence a Thaumatrope, which I afterwards sent down to Slough to the late Lady Herschel. It was precisely the thing which her son and Dr. Fitton had contributed to invent, which amused all their friends for a time, and had been forgotten. The thaumatrope, then, did nothing more than illustrate the power of the eye to weld together a couple of alternating impressions. The toys to which we shall next pass represent the same principle, 
working in a different direction towards the production of a living picture. The toys to which we shall next pass represent the same principle, working in a different direction towards the production of the living picture. Now, when we see a man running, to take an instance, we see the same body and the same legs continuously but in different positions, which merge insensibly the one into the other. No method of reproducing that impression of motion is possible if only one drawing, diagram, or photograph be employed. A man represented with as many legs as a centipede should not give us any impression of running or movement, and a blur showing the position taken successively by his legs would be equally futile. Therefore we are driven back to a series of pictures, slightly different from one another, and in order that the pictures may not be blurred, a screen must be interposed before the eye while the change from picture to picture is made. The shorter the period of change, the greater the number of pictures presented to illustrate a single motion, the more realistic is the effect. These are the general principles which have to be observed in all mechanism for the production of an illusory effect of motion. The persistence of vision has led to the invention of many optical toys, the names of which, in common with the names of most apparatus connected with the living picture, are remarkable for their length. Of these toys we will select three for special notice. In 1833 Plateau of Ghent invented the phenakistoscope, the thing that gives one false impression of reality, to interpret this formidable world. The phenakidoscope is a disc of card or metal round the edge of which are drawn a succession of pictures showing a man or animal in progressive positions. Between every two pictures a narrow slit is cut. The disc is mounted on an axle and revolved before a mirror, so that a person looking through the slits see one picture after another reflected in the mirror. The zoetrope, or wheel of life, which appeared first in 1860, is a modification of the same idea. In this instrument the pictures are arranged on the inner side of a hollow cylinder, revolving on a vertical axis, its sides being perforated with slits above the pictures. As the slits in both cases caused distortion, M. Reynold, a Frenchman, produced in 1877 the praxinoscope, which differed from the zoetrope in that the pictures were not seen directly through slits, but were reflected by mirrors set halfway between the pictures and the axis of the cylinder, a mirror for every picture. Only at the moment when the mirror is at right angles to the line of sight would the picture be visible. M. Reynaud also devised a special lantern for projecting praxinoscope pictures onto a screen. These and other somewhat similar contrivances, though ingenious, had very distinct limitations. They depended for their success upon the inventiveness and accuracy of the artist, who was confined in his choice of subject, and could, owing to the construction of the apparatus, only represent a small series of actions, indefinitely repeated by the machine. And as a complete action had to be crowded into a few pictures, the changes of position were necessarily abrupt. To make the living picture a success, two things were needed, some method of securing a very rapid series of many pictures, and a machine for reproducing the series, whatever its length. The method was found in photography, with the advance of which the living picture's progress is so closely related that it will be worth while to notice briefly the various improvements of photographic processes. The old-fashioned rigidtype process, discovered in 1839, required an exposure of half an hour. The introduction of wet collidion reduced this tax on a sitter's patience to ten seconds. In 1878, the dry plate process had still further shortened the exposure to one second. And since that date, the silver salt emulsions used in photography have had their sensitiveness to light so much increased that clear pictures can now be made in one thousandth of a second, a period minute enough to arrest the most rapid movements of animals. In 1878, therefore, instantaneous photography was ready to aid the living picture. Previously to that year, series of photographs had been taken from posed models, without, however, extending the choice of subject to any great extent. But between 1870 and 1880, two men, Marley and Mybridge, began working with a camera on the movement of horses. Marley endeavored to produce a series of pictures round the edge of one plate with a single lens and repeated exposures. Mybridge, on the other hand, used a series of cameras. 
he erected a long white background parallel to which were stationed the cameras at equal distances the shutters of the cameras were connected to threads laid across the intervals between the background and the cameras in such a manner that a horse driven along the track snapped them at regular intervals and brought about successive exposures my bridge's method was carried on by anschutz a german who in eighteen ninety nine brought out his electrical tachyscope or quick seer having secured his negatives he printed off transparent positives on glass and arranged these last round the circumference of a large disc rotating in front of a screen having in it a hole the size of transparencies as each picture came opposite the hole a geissler tube was momentarily lit up behind it by electrical contact giving a fleeting view of one phase of a horse's motion a very interesting article in may nineteen o two issue of persons magazine deals with the latest work of professor marley in the field of the photographic representation of the movements of birds men and quadrupeds in the introduction of the ribbon film in or about eighteen eighty eight open much greater possibilities to the living picture than would ever have existed had the glass plate been retained it was now comparatively easy to take a long series of pictures and accordingly we find messrs freeze green and evans exhibiting in eighteen ninety a camera capable of securing three hundred exposures in half a minute or ten per second the next apparatus to be specially mentioned is edison's kinetoscope which he first exhibited in england in eighteen ninety four as early as eighteen eighty seven mr edison had tried to produce animated pictures in a manner analogous to the making of a sound record on a phonograph see page fifty six he wrapped round a cylinder a sheet of sensitized celluloid which was covered after numerous exposures by a spiral line of tiny negatives the positives made from these were illuminated in turn by flashes of electric light this method was however entirely abandoned in the perfect kinetoscope an instrument for viewing pictures the size of a postage stamp carried on a continuously moving celluloid film between the eye of the observer and a small electric lamp the pictures pass the point of inspection at the rate of forty six per second a rate hitherto never approached and as each picture was properly centred a slit in a rapidly revolving shutter made it visible for a very small fraction of a second holes punched at regular intervals along each side of the film engaged with studs on a wheel and ensured a regular motion of the pictures this principle of perforated film has been used by nearly all subsequent manufacturers of animatographs. To secure 46 negatives per second, Edison invented a special exposure device. Each negative would have put one forty-sixth of a second to itself, and that must include the time during which the fresh surface of film was being brought into position before the lens. He therefore introduced an intermittent gearing, which jerked the film forward 46 times per second, but allowed to remain stationary for nine-tenths of the period allotted to each picture. During the time of movement, the lens was covered by the shutter. This principle of exposure has also been largely adopted by other inventors. By its means, weak negatives are avoided, while pictures projected on a screen gain greatly in brilliancy and steadiness. The capabilities of a long, flexible film band have been shown by Edison. He was no longer without imitators fanatoscopes bioscopes photoscopes and many other instruments followed in quick succession in eighteen ninety five messrs lumiere scored a great success with their cinematograph which they exhibited at marcel in paris throwing the living picture as we now know it onto a screen for a large company to see this camera lantern opens the era of commercial animated photography the number of patents taken out since eighteen ninety five in connection with living picture machines is sufficient proof that inventors have either found in this particular branch of photography a peculiar fascination or have anticipated from it a substantial profit a company known as the mutoscope and biograph company has been formed for the sole object of working the manufacture and exhibition of the living picture on a great commercial scale the present company is american but there are subsidiary allied companies in many parts of the world including the british isles france italy belgium germany austria india australia south africa the part that the company has played in the development of animated photography will be easily understood from the short account that follows 
The company controls three machines, the mutograph, or camera for making negatives, the biograph, a lantern for throwing pictures onto the screen, and the mutoscope, a familiar apparatus in which the same pictures may be seen in a different fashion on the payment of a penny. Externally, the mutograph is remarkable for its size, which makes it a giant of its kind. The complete apparatus weighs, with its accumulators, 700 pounds. It takes a very large picture, as anemograph pictures go, 2 by 2 and a half inches, which, besides giving increased detail, require less severe magnification than is usual with other film. The camera can make up to a 100 exposures per second, in which time 22 feet of film will have passed before the lens. The film is so heavy that were it arrested bodily during each exposure and then jerked forward again, it might be injured. The mechanism of the mutograph, driven at regular speed by an electric motor, has been so arranged as to halt only that part of the film which is being exposed, the rest moving forward continuously. The exposed portion, together with the next surface, which has accumulated in the loop behind it, is dragged on by two rollers that are in contact with the film during part only of the revolutions. Thus the jerky motion is confined to but a few inches of the film, and even at the highest speeds the camera is peculiarly free from vibration. An exposed mutograph film is wound for development round a skeleton reel, three feet in diameter and seven feet long, which rotates in a shallow trough containing the developing solution. Development complete, the reel is lifted from its supports and suspended over a succession of other troughs for washing, fixing, and final washing. When dry, the negative film is passed through a special printing frame in contact with another film, which receives a positive image from the biograph. The difficulty of handling such films will be appreciated to a certain extent even by those whose experience is confined to the snaky behavior of a short Kodak reel during development. The Mutoscope Company's organization is as perfect as its machinery. It has representatives in all parts of the world. Wherever stirring events are taking place, whether in peace or war, a mutograph operator will soon be on the spot with his heavy apparatus to secure pictures for worldwide exhibition. It need hardly be said that great obstacles, human and physical, have often to be overcome before a film can be exposed, and considerable personal danger encountered. We read that an operator, dispatched to Cuba during the Spanish-American War, was left three days and nights without food or water to guard his precious instruments, and partly that had landed him having suddenly put to sea on a sighting a Spanish cruiser. Another is reported to have a narrow escape from being captured at sea by the Spaniards after a hot chase. It is also on record that a mutograph set up in Atlantic City to take possession of fire engines was charged and shattered by one of the engines, that the operators were flung into the crowd, and that nevertheless the box containing the exposed films was uninjured, and on development yielded a very sensational series of pictures lasting to the moment of collision. The Mutoscope Company owns several thousand series of views, none probably more valuable than those of His Holiness the Pope, who graciously gave Mr. W. K. Dickinson five special sittings, during which no less than 17,000 negatives were made, each one of great interest to millions of people throughout the world. The company spares neither time nor money in its endeavor to supply the public with what will prove acceptable. A year's output runs into a couple of hundred miles of film, as much as 700 feet is sometimes expended on a single series, which may be worth anything up to 1,000 pounds. The energy displayed by the operators is often marvelous. To take instances, the Derby of 1898 was run at 3.20 p.m. At 10 o'clock the race was run again by biograph on the great sheet of the Palace Theater. On the homecoming of Lord Kitchener from the Sudan campaign, a series of photographs was taken at Dover in the afternoon and exhibited the same evening, or again to consider a wider sphere of action. The Jubilee procession of 1897 was watched in New York ten days after the event, two days later in Chicago, and in three more the films were attracting large audiences in San Francisco, 5,000 miles from the actual scene of the procession. One may easily weary of a series of single views passed slowly through a magic lantern at a lecture or entertainment, but when the biograph is flashing its records at lightning speed, 
there is no cause for dullness. It is impossible to escape from the fascination of movement. A single photograph gives the impression of mere resemblance to the original, but a series, each reinforcing the signification of the last, breathes life into the dead image and deludes us into the belief that we see not the representation of the thing but the thing itself. The bill of fare provided by the Biograph Company is varied enough to suit the most fastidious taste. Now it is the great naval review off Spithead, or President Fowler shooting pheasants on his preserves near Paris. A moment's pause, and then the magnificent falls of Niagara from across the sheet. Maxim guns fire harmlessly. Panoramic scenes taken from locomotives running at high velocity unfold themselves to the delighted spectators, who feel as if they really were speeding over open country, among towering rocks, or plunging into the darkness of a tunnel. Here is an express approaching with all the quiver and fuss of real motion, so faithfully rendered that it seems as if a catastrophe were imminent, when snap, we are transported a hundred miles to watch it glide into a station. The doors open, passengers step out and shake hands with friends, porters bustle about after luggage, doors are slammed again, the guard waves his flag, and the carriage moves slowly out of the picture. Then our attention is switched away to the ten-inch disappearing gun, landing and firing at Sandy Hook. And next, as though to show that nothing is beneath the notice of the biograph, we are perhaps introduced to a family of small pigs, feeding from a trough with porcine earnestness and want of manners. It must not be thought that the living picture caters for mere entertainment only. It serves some very practical and useful ends. By its aid the movement of machinery and the human muscle may be studied in detail, to aid a mechanical or medical education. It furnishes art schools with all the poses of a living model. Less serious pursuits, such as dancing, boxing, wrestling, and all athletic sports and exercise, will find a use for it. As an advertising medium, it stands unrivaled, and we shall owe it a deep debt of gratitude if it ultimately supplants the flaring posters that disfigure our towns and desiccate our landscapes. Not so long ago, the directors of the Nordershire Lloyd Steamship Company hired the biograph at the Palace Theatre, London, to demonstrate to anybody who cared to witness a very interesting exhibition that their line of vessels should always be used for a journey between England and America. The living picture has been impressed into the service of the British Empire to promote emigration to the colonies. Three years ago, Mr. Freer exhibited at the Imperial Institute and in other places in England a series of films representing the 1897 harvest in Manitoba. Would-be emigrants were able to satisfy themselves that the great Canadian plains were fruitful not only on paper. For could they not see with their own eyes the stately procession of automatic binders, reaping, binding, and delivering sheaves of wheat, and puffing engines threshing out the grain ready for market? A far preferable method, this is the bogus description of land companies, such as Lord Chuzzlewit's and Mark Tapley, into the deadly swamps of Eden. Again, what more calculated to recruit boys for our warships than the fine polytechnic exhibition known as Our Navy? What words spoken or printed could have the effect of a series of vivid scenes truthfully rendered, of drills on board ships, the manning and firing of big guns, the limbering up of smaller guns, the discharge of torpedoes, the headlong rush of the destroyers? The mutoscope to which references had been made above may be found in most places of public entertainment, in refreshment bars, on piers, in exhibitions, on promenades. A penny dropped into a slot releases a handle, the turning of which brings a series of pictures under inspection. The pictures enlarged from mutograph films are mounted in consecutive order round a cylinder, standing out like the leaves of a book. When the cylinder is revolved by means of the handle, the picture cards are snapped past the eye, giving an effect similar to the lifelike projections on a biograph screen. From 900 to 1,000 pictures are mounted on a cylinder. The advantages of the mutoscope its convenient size, its simplicity, and the ease with which its contents may be changed to illustrate the topics and events of the day, have made the animated photograph extremely popular. It does for vision what the phonograph does for sound. In a short time we shall doubtless be provided with handy machines, combining the two functions and giving us double value for our penny. The real importance and value of animated photography 
will be more easily estimated a few years hence than today, when it is still more or less a novelty. The multiplication of illustrated newspapers and magazines points to a general desire for pictorial matter to help down the daily, weekly, or monthly budget of news, even if the illustrations be imaginative products of Fleet Street rather than faithful to fact. The reliable living picture, we expect the set scene, which holds up a mirror to nature, will be a companion rather than a rival of journalism, following hard on the description in print of an event that has taken place under the eye of the recording camera. The zest with which we have watched during the last two years biographic views of the embarkation and disembarkation of troops, of the transport of big guns through drifts in difficult country, and of other circumstances of war, is largely due to the descriptions we have already read of the things that we see on the screen. And on the other hand, the impression left by a series of animated views will dwell in our memories long after the contents of the newspaper columns have become confused and jumbled. It is therefore especially to be hoped that photographic records will be kept in historic events, such as the Jubilee, the Queen's Funeral, King Edward's Coronation, so that future generations may, by the turning of a handle, be brought face to face with the great doings of a bygone age. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Manning Cross. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter Eleven The Great Paris Telescope. A telescope so powerful that it brings the moon apparently to within thirty five miles of the earth, so long that many a cricketer could not throw a ball from one end of it to the other, so heavy that it would by itself make a respectable load for a goods train, so expensive that astronomically inclined millionaires might well hesitate to order a similar one for their private use, such is the huge Paris telescope that in 1900 delighted thousands of visitors in the French Exposition, where, among the many wonderful sights to be seen on all sides, it probably attracted more notice than any other exhibit. This triumph of scientific engineering and dogged perseverance in the face of great difficulties owes its being to a suggestion made in 1894 to a group of French astronomers by Monsieur Deloncourt. He proposed to bring astronomy to the front at the coming exposition, and to effect this by building a refracting telescope that in size and power should completely eclipse all existing instruments and add a new chapter to the story of the heavens. To the mind unversed in astronomy, the telescope appeals by the magnitude of its dimensions, in the same way as do the fourth bridge, the Eiffel Tower, the big wheel, the Statue of Liberty near New York Harbor, the pyramids, and most human-made biggest on records. At the time of M. Delancol's proposal, the largest refracting telescope was the Yerkes at Williams Bay, Wisconsin, with an object glass 40 inches in diameter, and next to it, the 36-inch lick instrument on Mount Hamilton, California, built by Messrs. Alvan Clark of Cambridgeport, Massachusetts. Among reflecting telescopes, the prior place is still held by Lord Rosses, set up on the lawn of Burr Castle half a century ago. Its speculum, or mirror, weighing three tons, lies at the lower end of a tube, six feet across and sixty feet long. This huge reflector, being mounted in meridian, moves only in a vertical direction. A refracting telescope is one of the ordinary pocket type, having an object lens at one end and an eyepiece at the other. A reflector, on the other hand, has no object lens, its place being taken by a mirror that gathers the rays entering the tube and reflects them back into the eyepiece, 
which is situated nearer the mouth end of the tube than the mirror itself. Each system has its peculiar disadvantages. In reflectors, the image is more or less distorted by spherical aberration. In refractors, the image is approximately perfect in shape, but liable to chromatic aberration, a phenomenon especially noticeable in cheap telescopes and field glasses, which often show objects fringed with some of the colors of the spectrum. This defect arises from the different refrangibility of different light rays. Thus, violet rays come to a focus at a shorter distance from the lens than red rays, and when one set is in focus to the eye, the other must be out of focus. In carefully made and expensive instruments, compound lenses are used, which by the employment of different kinds of glass, bring all the colors to practically the same focus, and so do away with chromatic aberration. To reduce color troubles to a minimum, Monsieur de Longcol proposed that the object lens should have a focal distance of about 200 feet, since a long focus is more easily corrected than a short one, and a diameter of over 59 inches. The need for so huge a lens arises out of the optical principles of a refractor. The rays from an object, a star for instance, strike the object glass at the near end and are bent by it into a converging beam till they all meet at the focus. Behind the focus, they again separate and are caught by the eyepiece, which reduces them to a parallel beam small enough to enter the pupil. We thus see that though the unaided eye gathers only the few rays that fall directly from the object onto the pupil, when helped by the telescope, it receives the concentrated rays falling on the whole area of the object glass, and it would be sensible of a greatly increased brightness had not this light to be redistributed over the image, which is the object magnified by the eyepiece. Assuming the aperture of the pupil to be one-tenth of an inch, and the object to be magnified a hundred times, the object lens should have a hundred times the diameter of the pupil, to render the image as bright as the object itself. If the lens be five instead of ten inches across, a great loss of light results, as in the high powers of a microscope, and the image loses in distinctness what it gains in size. As M. de Longcol meant his telescope to beat all records in respect of magnification, he had no choice but to make a lens that should give proportionate illumination, and itself be of unprecedented size. At first, M. de Longcol met with considerable opposition and ridicule. Such a scheme as his was declared to be beyond accomplishment. But in spite of many prophecies of ultimate failure, he set to work, entrusting the construction of the various portions of his colossal telescope to well-tried experts. To Monsieur Gautier was given the task of making all the mechanical parts of the apparatus. To Monsieur Mantois, the casting of the giant lenses. To Monsieur Despray, the casting of the huge mirror to which reference will be made immediately. The first difficulty to be encountered arose from the sheer size of the instrument. It was evidently impossible to mount such a leviathan in the ordinary way. A tube, 180 feet long, could not be made rigid enough to move about and yet permit careful observation of the stars. Even supposing that it were satisfactorily mounted on an equatorial foot like smaller glasses, how could it be protected from wind and weather? To cover it, a mighty dome, 200 feet or more in diameter, would be required. A dome exceeding by over 70 feet the cupola of St. Peter's Rome, and this dome must revolve easily on its base at a pace of about 50 feet an hour, so that the telescope might follow the motion of the heavenly bodies. The constructors, therefore, decided to abandon any idea of making a telescope that could be moved about and pointed in any desired direction. The alternative course open to them 
was to fix the telescope itself rigidly in position and to bring the stars within its field by means of a mirror mounted on a massive iron frame the two together technically called a siderostat the mirror and its support would be driven by clockwork at the proper sidereal rate the siderostat principle had been employed as early as the eighteenth century and perfected in recent years by leon foucault so that in having recourse to it the builders of the telescope were not committing themselves to any untried device in days when the handling of masses of iron and the erection of huge metal constructions have become matters of everyday engineering life no peculiar difficulty presented itself in connection with the metalwork of the telescope the greatest possible care was of course observed in every particular all joints and bearings were adjusted with an extraordinary accuracy and all the cylindrical moving parts of the siderostat verified till they did not vary from perfect cylindricity by so much as one twenty-five thousandth of an inch the tube of the telescope one hundred eighty feet long consisted of twenty-four sections fifty-nine inches in diameter bolted together and supported on seven massive iron pillars it weighed twenty-one tons the siderostat twenty-seven feet high and as many in length weighed forty-five tons the lower portion which was fixed firmly on a bed of concrete had on the top a tank filled with quicksilver in which the mirror and its frame floated the quicksilver supported nine-tenths of the weight the rest being taken by the levers used to move the mirror though the total weight of the mirror and frame was thirteen tons the quicksilver offered so little resistance that a pull of a few pounds sufficed to rotate the entire mass the real romance of the construction of this huge telescope centers on the making of the lenses and mirror first-class lenses for all photographic and optical purposes command a very high price on account of the care and labor that has to be expended on their production the value of the glass being trifling by comparison few if any trades require greater mechanical skill than that of lens making the larger the lens the greater the difficulties it presents first in the casting then in the grinding last of all in the polishing the presence of a single air bubble in the molten glass the slightest irregularity of surface in the polishing may utterly destroy the value of a lens otherwise worth several thousands of pounds the object glass of the great telescope was cast by m mantois famous as the manufacturer of large lenses the glass used was boiled and reboiled many times to get rid of all bubbles then it was run into a mould and allowed to cool very gradually a whole month elapsed before the breaking of a mould when the lens often proved to be cracked on the surface owing to the exterior having cooled faster than the interior and parted company with it at last however a perfect cast resulted m d'esprit undertook the even more formidable task of casting the mirror at his works at jumont north france a special furnace and oven capable of containing over fifteen tons of molten glass had to be constructed the mirror six and a half feet in diameter and eleven inches thick absorbed three and three-quarter tons of liquid glass and so great was the difficulty of cooling it gradually that out of the twenty casts eighteen were failures the rough lenses and mirror having been ground to approximate correctness in the ordinary way there arose the question of polishing which is generally done by one of the most sensitive and perfect instruments existing the human hand in this case owing to the enormous size of the objects to be treated handwork would not do the mere hot touch of a workman 
would raise on the glass a tiny protuberance, which would be worn level with the rest of the surface by the polisher, and on the cooling of the part would leave a depression, only one and seventy-five thousand of an inch deep, perhaps, but sufficient to produce distortion, and require that the lens should be ground down again, and the whole surface polished afresh. Monsieur Gautier therefore polished by machinery. It proved a very difficult process altogether, on account of frictional heating, the rise of temperature in the polishing room, and the presence of dust. To ensure success, it was found necessary to warm all the polishing machinery, and to keep it at a fixed temperature. At the end of almost a year, the polishing was finished, after the lenses and mirror had been subjected to the most searching tests, able to detect irregularities not exceeding one and two hundred fifty thousand of an inch. Monsieur Gautier applied to the mirror Monsieur Foucault's test, which is worth mentioning. A point of light thrown by the mirror is focused through a telescope. The eyepiece is then moved inwards and outwards, so as to throw the point out of focus. If the point becomes a luminous circle, surrounded by concentric rings, the surface throwing the light point is perfectly plain or smooth. If, however, a pushing in shows a vertical flattening of the point, and a pulling out a horizontal flattening, that part is concave. If the reverse happens, convexity is the cause. For the removal of the mirror from Jumont to Paris, a special train was engaged, and precautions were taken rivaling those by which traveling royalty is guarded. The train ran at night without stopping, and at a constant pace, so that the vibration of the glass atoms might not vary. On arriving at Paris, the mirror was transferred to a ponderous wagon, and escorted by a body of men to the exposition buildings. The huge object lens received equally careful treatment. The telescope was housed at the exhibition in a long gallery pointing due north and south, the siderostat at the north end, at the other, the eyepiece end, a large amphitheater accommodated the public assembled to watch the projection of stellar or lunar images onto a screen thirty feet high, while a lecturer explained what was visible from time to time. The images of the sun and moon, as they appeared at the primary focus in the eyepiece, measured from 21 to 22 inches in diameter, and the screen projections were magnified from these about 30 times superficially. The eyepiece section consisted of a short tube of the same breadth as the main tube, resting on four wheels that traveled along rails. Special gearing moved this truck-like construction backwards and forwards to bring a sharp focus into the eyepiece or onto a photographic plate. Focusing was thus easy enough when once the desired object came in view, but the observer being unable to control the siderostat, 250 feet distant, had to telephone directions to an assistant stationed near the mirror whenever he wished to examine an object not in the field of vision. By the courtesy of the proprietors of the Strand magazine, we are allowed to quote Monsieur Deloncle's own words, describing his emotions on his first view through the giant telescope. As is invariably the case, whenever an innovation that sets at naught old established theories is brought forward, the prophecies of failure were many and loud, and I had more than a suspicion that my success would cause less satisfaction to others than to myself. Better than anyone else, I myself was cognizant of the unpropitious conditions in which my instrument had to work. The proximity of the river, the dust raised by hundreds of thousands of trampling feet, the trepidation of the soil, the working of the machinery, the changes of temperature, the glare from the thousands of electric lamps in close proximity, each of these circumstances, and many others of a more technical nature, which it would be tedious to enumerate, but which were no less important, 
would have been more than sufficient to make any astronomer despair of success even in observatories where all the surroundings are chosen with the utmost care in regions pure of calm and serene air large new instruments take months more often years to regulate properly in spite of everything however i still felt confident our calculations had been gone over again and again and i could see nothing that in my opinion warranted the worst apprehensions of my kind critics it was with ill-restrained impatience that i waited for the first night when the moon should show herself in a suitable position for being observed but the night arrived in due course everything was in readiness the movable portion of the roof of the building had been slid back and the mirror of the siderostat stood bared to the sky in the dark square chamber at the other end of the instrument two hundred feet away into which the eyepiece of the instrument opened i had taken my station with two or three friends and a tenant at the telephone stood waiting at my elbow to transmit my orders to his colleague in charge of the levers that regulated the siderostat and its mirror the moon had risen now and her silvery glory shone and sparkled in the mirror a right declension i ordered the telephone bell rang in reply slowly still slower now to the left enough again a right declension slower stop now very very slowly on the ground glass before our eyes the moon's image crept up from one corner until it had overspread the glass completely and there we stood in the centre of paris examining the surface of our satellite with all its craters and valleys and bleak desolation i had won the day End of chapter 11. Recorded by Manning Cross. Chapter 12 of The Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Manning Cross. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams Chapter 12 Photographing the Invisible Most of us are able to recognize when we see them. Shadowgraphs taken by the aid of the now famous X-rays. They generally represent some part of the structure of men, beasts, birds, or fishes. Very dark patches show the position of the bones large and small lighter patches the more solid muscles clinging to the bony framework and outside these again are shadowy tracks corresponding to the thinnest and most transparent portions of the fleshy envelope in an age fruitful as this in scientific marvels it often takes some considerable time for the public to grasp the full importance of a fresh discovery but when in 1896 it was announced that Professor Rontgen of Würzburg had actually taken photographs of the internal organs of still living creatures and penetrated metal and other opaque substances with a new kind of ray, great interest was manifested throughout the civilized world. On the one hand, the new photography seemed to upset popular ideas of opacity. On the other, it savored strongly of the black art and by its easy excursions through the human body seemed likely to revolutionize medical and surgical methods at first many strange ideas about the x-rays got afloat attributing to them powers which would have surprised even their modest discoverer it was also thought that the records were made in a camera after the ordinary manner of photography but as a matter of fact Rontgen used neither lens nor camera the operation being similar to that of casting a shadow on a wall by means of a lamp in x radiography a specially constructed electrically lit glass tube takes the place of the lamp and for the wall 
is substituted a sensitized plate. The object to be radiographed is merely inserted between them, its various parts offering varying resistance to the rays, so that the plate is affected unequally, and after exposure may be developed and printed from it the usual way. Photographs obtained by using X-rays are therefore properly called shadowgraphs or skyographs. The discovery that has made Professor Ronchin famous is, like many great discoveries, based upon the labors of other men in the same field. Geisler, whose vacuum tubes are so well known for their striking color effects, had already noticed that electric discharges sent through very much rarefied air or gases produced beautiful glows. Sir William Crookes, following the same line of research, and reducing with a Sprengel air pump the internal pressure of the tubes to one and one hundred thousand of an atmosphere, found that a luminous glow streamed from the cathode, or negative pole, in a straight line, heating and rendering phosphorescent anything that it met. Crookes regarded the glow as composed of radiant matter, and explained its existence as follows. The airy particles inside the tube, being few in number, are able to move about with far greater freedom than in the tightly packed atmosphere outside the tube. A particle, on reaching the cathode, is repelled violently by it in a straight line. To bombard another particle, the walls of the tube, or any object set up in its path, the sudden arrest of motion being converted into light and heat. By means of special tubes, he proved that the radiant matter could turn little veins, and that the flow continued even when the terminals of the shocking coil were outside the glass, thus meeting the contention of Peluge that the radiant matter was nothing more than small particles of platinum torn from the terminals. He also showed that, when intercepted, radiant matter cast a shadow, the intercepting object receiving the energy of the bombardment, but that when the obstruction was removed, the hitherto sheltered part of the glass wall of the tube glowed with a brighter phosphorescence than the part which had become tired by prolonged bombardment. Experiments further revealed the fact that the shaft of cathode rays could be deflected by a magnet from their course, and that they affected an ordinary photographic plate exposed to them. In 1894, Lenart, a Hungarian and pupil of the famous Hertz, fitted a crook's tube with a window of aluminum in its side, replacing a part of the glass, and saw that the course of the rays could be traced through the outside air. From this it was evident that something else than matter must be present in the shaft of energy sent from the negative terminal of the tube, as there was no direct communication between the interior and the exterior of the tube to account for the external phosphorescence. Whatever was the nature of the rays, he succeeded in making them penetrate and impress themselves on a sensitized plate enclosed in a metal box. Then, in 1896, came Ronchin's great discovery that the rays from a crook's tube, after traversing the glass, could pierce opaque matter. He covered the tube with thick cardboard, but found that it would still cast the shadows of books, cards, wood, metals, the human hand, etc., onto a photographic plate, even at the distance of some feet. The rays would also pass through the wood, metal, or bones in course of time. But certain bodies, notably metals, offered a much greater resistance than others, such as wood, leather, and paper. Professor Ronchin crowned his efforts by showing that a skeleton could be shadowgraphed while its owner was still alive. Naturally, everybody wished to know not only what the rays could do, but what they were. Ronchin, not being able to identify them with any known rays, took refuge in the algebraical symbol of the unknown quantity and dubbed them X-rays. He discovered this much, however, that they were invisible to the eye under ordinary conditions, that they traveled in straight lines only, passing through a prism, water, or other refracting bodies without turning aside from their path, 
and that a magnet exerted no power over them. This last fact was sufficient of itself to prevent their confusion with the radiant matter cathode rays of the tube. Bronchin thought, nevertheless, that they might be the cathode rays transmuted in some manner by their passage through the glass, so as to resemble in their motion sound waves, i.e. moving straight forward and not swaying from side to side in a series of zigzags. The existence of such ether waves had for some time before been suspected by Lord Kelvin. Other authorities have other theories. We may mention the view that X represents the ultraviolet rays of the spectrum, caused by vibrations of such extreme rapidity as to be imperceptible to the human eye, just as sounds of extremely high pitch are inaudible to the ear. This theory is, to a certain extent, upheld by the behavior of the photographic plate, which is least affected by the colors of the spectrum at the red end and most by those at the violet end. A photographer is able to use red or orange light in his dark room because his plates cannot see them, though he can, whereas the reverse would be the case with X-rays. This ultraviolet theory claims for X-rays a rate of ether vibration of trillions of waves per second. An alternative theory is to relegate the rays to the gap in the scale of ether waves between heat waves and light waves, but this does not explain any more satisfactorily than the other, the peculiar phenomenon of non-refraction. The apparatus employed in X photography consists of a Crookes tube of a special type, a powerful shocking or induction coil, a fluorescent screen and photographic plates and appliances for developing, etc., besides a supply of high-pressure electricity derived from the main, a small dynamo, or batteries. A Crookes tube is four to five inches in diameter, globular in its middle portion, but tapering away towards each end. Through one extremity is led a platinum wire, terminating in a saucer-shaped platinum plate an inch or so across. At the focus of this, the negative terminal, is fixed a platinum plate at an angle to the path of the rays so as to deflect them through the side of the tube. The positive terminal penetrates the glass at one side. The tube contains, as we have seen, a very tiny residue of air. If this were entirely exhausted, the action of the tube would cease, so that some tubes are so arranged that when rarefaction becomes too high, the passage of an electrical current through small bars of chemicals, whose ends project through the sides of the tube, liberates gas from the bars in sufficient quantity to render the tube active again. When the Ruhmkorff induction coil is joined to the electric circuit, a series of violent discharges of great rapidity occur between the tube terminals, resembling in their power the discharge of a Leyden jar, though for want of a dense atmosphere the brilliant spark has been replaced by a glow and brush light in the tube. The coil is of large dimensions, capable of passing a spark across an air gap of 10 to 12 inches. It will perhaps increase the reader's respect for X-rays to learn that a coil of proper size contains upwards of 13 miles of wire, though indeed this quantity is nothing in comparison with the 150 miles wound on the huge inductorium formerly exhibited at the London Polytechnic. If we were invited to an X-ray demonstration, we should find the operator and his apparatus in a darkened room. He turns on the current, and the darkness is broken by a velvety glow surrounding the negative terminal, which gradually extends until the whole tube becomes clothed in a green phosphorescence. A sharply defined line athwart the tube separates the shadowed part behind the receiving plate at the negative focus, now intensely hot, from that on which the reflected rays fall directly. One of us is now invited to extend a hand close to the tube, the operator then holds on the near side of the hand his fluorescent screen, which is nothing more than a framework 
supporting a paper smeared on one side with platino cyanide of barium, a chemical that, in common with several others, was discovered by Salvioni of Perugia to be sensitive to the rays and able to make them visible to the human eye. The value of the screen to the X-radiographer is that of the ground glass plate to the ordinary photographer, as it allows him to see exactly what things are before the sensitized plate is brought into position and in fact largely obviates the necessity for making a permanent record. The screen shows clearly and in full detail all the bones of the hand, so clearly that one is almost irresistibly drawn to peep behind to see if a real hand is there. One of us now extends an arm, and the screen shows us the ulna and the radius working round each other, now both visible, now one obscuring the other. On presenting the body to the course of the rays, a remarkable shadow is cast onto the screen. The spinal column and the ribs, the action of the heart and lungs, are seen quite distinctly. A deep breath causes the movement of a dark mass, the liver. There is no privacy in presence of the rays. The enlarged heart, the diseased lung, the ulcerated liver betrays itself at once. In a second of time, the phosphorescent screen reveals what might balk medical examination for months. If a photographic slide containing a dry plate be substituted for the focusing screen, the rays soon penetrate any covering in which the plate may be wrapped to protect it from ordinary light rays. The process of taking a shadow graph may therefore be conducted in broad daylight, which is under certain conditions a great advantage, though the sensitiveness of plates exposed to Ronchin rays entails special care being taken of them when they are not in use. In the early days of X radiography, an exposure of some minutes was necessary to secure a negative, but now, thanks to the improvements in the tubes, a few seconds is often sufficient. The discovery of the X-rays is a great discovery because it has done much to promote the noblest possible cause, the alleviation of human suffering. Not everybody will appreciate a more rapid mode of telegraphy or a new method of spinning yarn, but the dullest intellect will give due credit to a scientific process that helps to save life and limb. Who among us is not liable to break an arm or leg, or suffer from internal injuries invisible to the eye? Who among us, therefore, should not be thankful on reflecting that, in event of such a mishap, the X-rays will be at hand to show just what the trouble is, how to deal with it, and how far the healing advances day by day? The X-ray apparatus is now as necessary for the proper equipment of a hospital as a camera for that of a photographic studio. It is especially welcome in the hospitals which accompany an army into the field. Since May 1896, many a wounded soldier has had reason to bless the patient work that led to the discovery at Würzburg. The Greek War, the War in Cuba, the Tyra Campaign, the Egyptian campaign and the war in South Africa have given a quick succession of fine opportunities for putting the new photography to the test. There is now small excuse for the useless and agonizing probings that once added to the dangers and horrors of the military hospital. Even if the X-ray equipment by reason of its weight cannot conveniently be kept at the front of a rapidly moving army, it can be set up in the advanced or base hospitals, whither the wounded are sent after a first rough dressing of their injuries. The medical staff there subject their patients to the searching rays, are able to record the exact position of a bullet or shell fragment and the damage it has done, and by promptly removing the intruder to greatly lessen its power to harm. The Ronchin ray has added to the surgeon's armory a powerful weapon. Its possibilities are not yet fully known, but there can be no doubt that it marks a new epoch in surgical work, and for this reason, Professor Ronchin deserves to rank with Harvey, the discoverer of the blood circulation, with Jenner, the father of vaccination, and with Sir James Young Simpson, 
the first doctor to use chloroform as an anesthetic. End of chapter 12. Recorded by Manning Cross. Chapter 13 of The Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 13 Solar Motors. One day, George Stevenson and a friend stood watching a train drawn by one of his locomotives. "'What moves that train?' asked Stevenson. "'The engine,' replied his friend. "'And what moves the engine?' "'The steam.' "'And what produces the steam?' "'Coal.' "'And what produces coal?' This last query nonplussed his friend, and stevenson himself replied the sun the bottled sunshine that drove the locomotive was stored up millions of years ago in the dense forests then covering the face of the globe every day vegetation was built by the sunbeams and in the course of ages this growth was crushed into fossil form by the pressure of high piled rock and debris Today we cast black diamonds into our grates and furnaces to call out the warmth and power that is a legacy from a period long prior to the advent of fire-loving man, often forgetful of its real source. We see the influence of the sun more directly in the motions of wind and water. Had not the sun's action deposited snow and rain on the uplands of the world, there would be no roaring waterfall, no rushing torrent, no smooth flowing stream. But for the sun, heating the atmosphere unequally, there would not be that rushing of cool air to replace hot, which we know as wind. We press sol into our service when we burn fuel our windmills and watermills make him our slave of late years many prophets have arisen to warn us that we must not be too lavish of our coal that the time is not so far distant reckoning by centuries when the coal seams of the world will be worked out and leave our descendants destitute of what plays so important a part in modern life now though waste is unpardonable and the care for posterity praiseworthy there really seems to be no good reason why we should alarm ourselves about the welfare of the people of the far future even if coal fails the winds and the rivers will be there and the huge unharnessed energy of the tides and the sun himself is ready to answer appeals for help if rightly shaped he does not demand the prayers of persian fire worshippers but rather the scientific gathering of his good gifts place your hand on a roof lying square to the summer sun and you will find it too hot for the touch concentrate a beam of sunshine through a small burning glass how fierce is the small glowing focal spot that makes us draw our hands suddenly away suppose now a large glass many feet across bending several square yards of sun rays to a point and at that point a boiler the boiler would develop steam and the steam might be led into cylinders and forced to drudge for us do many of us realize the enormous energy of a hot summer's day the heat falling in the tropics on a single square foot of the earth's surface has been estimated as the equivalent of one-third of a horsepower. The force of Niagara itself would on this basis be matched by the sunshine streaming onto a square mile or so. A steamship might be propelled by the heat that scorches its decks. 
for many centuries inventors have tried to utilize this huge waste power we all know how according to the story archimedes burnt up the roman ships besieging his native town syracuse by concentrating on them the sun heat cast from hundreds of mirrors this story is less probable than interesting as a proof that the ancients were aware of the sun's power the first genuine solar machine was the work of ericsson the builder of the monitor he focused sun heat on a boiler which gave the equivalent of one horsepower for every hundred square feet of mirrors employed this was not what engineers would call a high efficiency a great deal of heat being wasted but it led the way to further improvements in america especially in the dry arid regions where fuel is scarce and the sun shines pitilessly day after day all the year round sun catchers of various types have been erected and worked successfully dr william calver of washington has built in the barren wastes of arizona huge frames of mirrors travelling on circular rails so that they may be brought to face the sun at all hours between sunrise and sunset dr calver employs no less than sixteen hundred mirrors as each of these mirrors develops ten to fifteen degrees of heat it is obvious after an appeal to simple arithmetic that the united efforts of these reflectors should produce the tremendous temperature sixteen thousand to twenty four thousand degrees which expressed comparatively means the paltry ninety degrees in the shade beneath which we grow restive multiplied hundreds of times hitherto the greatest known heat had been that of the arc of the electric lamp in which the incandescent particles between pole and pole attain six thousand degrees fahrenheit the combined effect of the burning mirrors is irresistible they can we are told in a few moments reduce russian iron to the consistency of warmed wax though it mocks the heat of many blast furnaces they will bake bricks twenty times as rapidly as any kiln and the bricks produced are not the friable blocks which a mason chips easily with his trowel but bodies so hard as to scratch case-hardened steel there are at work in california sun motors of another design the reader must imagine a huge conical lampshade turned over onto its smaller end its inner surface lined with nearly eighteen hundred mirrors two feet long and three inches broad the whole supported on a light iron framework and he will have a good idea of the apparatus used on the pasadena ostrich farm the machine is arranged in meridian that is at right angles to the path of the sun which it follows all day long by the agency of clockwork in the focus of the mirrors is a boiler thirteen feet six inches long coated with black heat absorbing substances this boiler holds over one hundred gallons of water and being fed automatically will raise steam untended all the day through the steam is led by pipes to an engine working a pump capable of delivering fourteen hundred gallons per minute the cheapness of the apparatus in proportion to its utility is so marked that in regions where sunshine is almost perpetual the solar motor will in time become as common as our windmills and factory chimneys elsewhere if the heat falling on a few square yards of mirror lifts nearly one hundred thousand gallons of water an hour there is indeed hope for the sahara the persian desert arabia mongolia mexico australia that is to say 
if the water under the earth be in these parts as plentiful as the sunshine above it the effect of water on the most unpromising soil is marvellous already in algeria the french have reclaimed thousands of square miles by scientific irrigation in australia huge artesian wells have made habitable for man and beast millions of acres that were before desert it is only a just retribution that the sun should be harnessed and compelled to draw water for tracts to which he has so long denied it the sun motor is only just entering on its useful career and at present we can but dream of the great effects it may have on future civilization yet its principle is so simple so scientific and so obvious that it is easy to imagine it at no far distant date a dangerous rival to king cole himself to quarry coal from the bowels of the earth and transform it into heat is to traverse two sides of a triangle the third being to use the sunshine of the passing hour End of chapter 13